On July 4, 2015, the West Building of the Jie Yu Shu Material Factory collapsed in Wenling, China. The accident claimed the lives of 14 employees and injured dozens. On one level, it is a familiar story, one of negligence, greed, and the consequences of failed oversight. But in January 2014, a factory fire had sent government officials scrambling. The result was a series of sweeping, disruptive safety reforms. On paper, safety was now the industry's top priority. So, what happened? The Jie Yu factory collapse is a painful reminder of what can happen when policy and safety do not always align. The building seemed destined to fail. Jie Yu's owner, Xu Wu Lin, built the four-story factory illegally. For the project, he leased land he could not legally lease from a local village. Construction began in 2009 and continued into 2012. During the build, Xu did not apply for planning permission or permits. The building also did not adhere to local building regulations. Xu hired no architects or engineers. Instead, he drew the building plan himself. To realize his vision, he contracted unqualified construction workers. These contractors would then use the materials Xu supplied to build the structure as best they knew how. Illegal construction is commonplace in China. Local officials knew about the illegal factory as early as October 2011. City officials tried many times to demolish the building, but even with a court order, the demolition never happened. The process was soon in administrative limbo. So, in 2013, a second shoe factory, Tongwei Footwear Factory, rented the fourth floor of Jie Yu's West Building. The structure had a massive water reservoir built into the roof. Tong Wei employees reported the fourth floor walls were sometimes wet to the touch. Then in 2014, a fire tore through a different shoe factory in Wenling City, leaving 16 people dead. You see, Wenling is famous for its shoe industry. Its tourism office claims one in every five pairs of shoes worldwide are made in their factories. It's a vital part of the local economy. So, when after the fire, the government began to shut down shoe factories, people protested in droves. These were their livelihoods. The first injunctions led to the closure of 4,500 shoe factories. During this phase, local officials demolished thousands of private homes and other buildings. Some factories would renovate and reopen. Still, after a year, the total shoe factories in one Ling city had dropped from 11,000 to a staggering 5,000. Meanwhile, the order to demolish the Jie Yu factory sat in administrative limbo. For Jie Yu's 130 employees, life marched on. On the fourth floor, the Tong Hui employees continued to report the leaking water reservoir on the roof. Before the building collapsed, no penalties were ever applied. The collapse finally happened at 4.08 p.m. on July 4th, 2015. It was a Saturday shift for the 51 Tonghui employees on the site. The rest of the building, still operated by Jie Yu, was comparatively empty. Only five people not working for Tonghui were present when the collapse happened. Yang Songquen, 42, a workshop supervisor at Tonghui, described his experience. I was doing something and without warning, boom, the building collapsed. Almost at the same time, water poured down. I was trapped in the water for a minute or two, and then the water drained away. The floor buckled and a hole opened. I saw a way out and ran. The building had flattened from the fourth to the second floor. Yang would remain on site to help rescue his co-workers until blood in his eyes forced him to turn back. Mao Liuan, another survivor, whose wife also worked at the factory, described the fall to the third floor. It was pitch black, he said. I heard the pinned workers around me calling for help. I didn't know where my wife was, so I panicked. He found himself near an opening in the rubble and was able to climb to safety. Meanwhile, the reservoir water washed Hu Yongxian out from under the rubble of the fallen ceiling. The timing was fortuitous. Electrical wires in the workshop had sparked and started a fire. Rescuers would ultimately find 33 people injured and 14 people deceased. The direct economic cost resulting from the accident was more than 11 million yuan. That's 1.64 million US dollars. 
During the subsequent investigation, investigators found fault in the building's design and construction. The roof, made from pre-stressed concrete panels and 12 centimeter thick reinforced concrete, could not support its massive water reservoir. In fact, the load-bearing capacity of the roof was never calculated. The load-bearing capacity of the steel concrete structure was also insufficient. After construction, heavy shoe factory machinery had been brought in, increasing building loads. So in the end, Xu Fulin and Jie Yu were found to be clearly at fault. Xu was arrested and pled guilty, receiving a comparatively light sentence of five years in prison. He also paid out 12 million yuan, that's 1.79 million US dollars, to the victim's families. But the investigators were not finished assigning blame. Xu could never have built the structure had the local village administration not illegally rented him the land. Moreover, the report states the one Ling municipal government, quote, did not investigate and deal with a large number of illegal land occupations and illegal constructions in their jurisdictions. They also did not supervise the upgrade work happening in some industrial areas. Now remember, this included during the safety overhaul triggered by the January 2014 fire. During that time, thousands of illegal or unsafe businesses were shut down and their buildings demolished. The way I see this, the reason the Xie Yu factory was overlooked was likely economics. During the protests over the factory closures, one interviewee said, If an airplane crashes, do you ground every airplane? After a plane crash, you generally don't ground all aircraft. But if a particular model of plane crashes, it can make sense to ground the fleet. In this case, that would mean prioritizing buildings that are similar to that which caught fire, right? That is seemingly not what happened. Taizhou Daodong Shoes Company Limited, where the fire took place, had 83 employees. Admittedly, business wasn't exactly booming. The year before, they were worth only about 5 million yuan, that's 745,000 US dollars. But in Wenling City in 2014, the shoe industry was overwhelmingly small businesses. Many of the targeted companies were people living and working in the same small space. This was often unsafe, which deserves regulatory intervention. I'm not questioning that. But was also, importantly, economically inefficient. An industry built on small businesses was, frankly, bad for long-term economic growth. You can see this in the city's reopening conditions. If a closed business wanted to reopen, it needed a registered capital of 1 million yuan. That's 149,000 American dollars. For many businesses that would eventually consolidate or close, that amount was out of reach. The 2014 regulatory changes were based on safety concerns, but practically prioritized the economic health of the industry. The seeming end result is the one Ling government missing larger companies and their unsafe illegal buildings operating outside the law. This was to their detriment and to the cost of 14 lives. In the end, the mayor of Wenling City, Li Yibeng, was compelled to resign. His deputy mayor was similarly removed from his position. More than 20 political appointees received party discipline. In their closing, investigators called on Wenling City to learn from the accident and learn from the past. Hopefully this time the message, that economics can't distract from safety without consequences, will finally stick. Thank you for coming on this dark and troubling journey with me. If you're interested in fresh looks at sometimes dark subject matter, subscribe to this channel. If you have an idea for a future video, let me know in the comments below.